Hey there, I'm Sean from ARRI, and this is your introduction to the new Camera Companion app. The ARRI Camera Companion app is a freely available app that you can download from the App Store on any iPhone or iPad, or from the App Store on Mac OS if you have an M1 or M2 powered Mac. So you can get the iPad application for your Mac and then that might be a nice way to put in metadata settings if you're a DIT or control the camera on set with a laptop if you like. The cool thing with the app is that we're actually not really sure how you will use it and we would love to get your feedback. At the moment, I'm still using the beta version of the app which we hope to make available around August of 2022 and we expect to put a lot more functionality and features and make changes and maybe develop the UI a bit over the next coming months and years. So any feedback that you have is really valuable. If there's something that you think is missing or maybe something you really like that we should accentuate or maybe you have a suggestion for a layout of tiles and buttons that you think should be included with the default ones, then please send it to us. We'd love to understand how you're using it and you can get in touch with the development team at companionapp at ari.de. That email is in the description just below. So in this video, I'm gonna take you through how to connect the device you have to a camera and how to set up the app and show you a little bit about the basic functionality and what each of the buttons can do because that's a nice thing. You don't have to use everything. It's fully customizable, this interface. I'm also going to talk a little bit towards the end about how you can have multiple cameras connected to the app, which I think is pretty cool for multicam scenarios as well. And then we'll be releasing more updated content as we develop more features for the app. So I've got a camera here and the app is obviously going to work best if you also have a camera, but there is also a way to have a mock camera set up in the app so that you can still play around and make your own layouts and check out the interface and figure out what things do. And the instructions for setting up a mock camera instead of a real one, they're also in that video description just below. So when I go through and I put the settings for this camera in, well, that's where you would put the fake ones in. Now, you've opened the app. It'll come to the project page, which is probably going to be empty because you haven't used it before. So hit new project. First thing to do is put in a project name. So I'm gonna call this project the Tech Talk. So the next one on the list is the units. Now the Germans, they love metric, but I know most of the industry pulls focus in imperial measurements in feet and inches. So if that is you, like me, change that to imperial. Identify cameras. Now this describes how the app will show what your camera is called. If you select by index, then it will call all the cameras. If you have multiple cameras, A, B, C, etc., and it will suggest the default colors. So usually a camera on set is the red color and the B camera on set would be blue and C might be yellow or green, depending where you are. So that's the index. Now, if you choose by description instead, it will name the cameras with whatever you put in as the description down below. So if you're in a multicam scenario, maybe you wanna name the cameras Steadicam or Crane or Front of House or whatever you like. So that would be a description version of the naming. I'm just gonna leave it on index. Now I have to select Alexa 35 prototype naming, which may or may not be an option in the app, depending on when you're using this. Um, but I have a prototype Alexa 35 here, it's a special thing. You can ignore that if it doesn't apply to you. Next down below, auto connect to wireless network. So I'm gonna turn that on, because what we're gonna do is basically set up the camera, so it's generating a Wi-Fi network, and then this little iPad mini will connect to the camera directly. You could also have the camera connect to a larger Wi-Fi network that you've set up with your own router, and then you have different devices which would connect to that. It means you can have multiple cameras connected to one Wi-Fi network, and monitor them all at once. So that is a different way to do it. So at the moment, auto connect to camera to wireless network, which would be generated by the camera. The next one is connect directly to camera Wi-Fi. Yes, we want to do that. And then that simplifies this a bit. You'll see that you use Bonjour Discovery, which is only applicable if you are connecting to a larger network, not the one on the camera. So now that we've got this little bit set up, you'll notice down below, we have to put in the settings for the camera. So index, 
A. I only have one camera. Let's make this the A camera. It will default to being red, but if you would like to change the color, you can hit that little color wheel in the corner there, and then it will open uh, a little dialog box where you can select different colors, like so. I'm gonna leave it on red. Just below that, enter your serial number for the camera. So the serial number is printed on the camera, on the Mini and the Mini LF, it's on the bottom, and on the Alexa 35, it's just behind the card bay here. So this camera is 50321, and put that in. Wireless password. Now, we're just gonna jump over to the camera here, and I'm gonna show you where the Wi-Fi settings are on the camera. This would be exactly the same on any Alexa 35 or Alexa Mini LF. If you have a Mini or an Amira, it's a very similar place in the menu, and I'm sure you'll figure it out. So, first off, we go into the menu, and then we wanna scroll down, so you'll scroll down to the system page, and then I want you to scroll down to network slash Wi-Fi. If we go in there, you can see that depending on how the camera is set up, the Wi-Fi power may be on or off. It needs to be on and it needs to be set in the Wi-Fi mode to host. So the way to change that if it's not in host is to turn the Wi-Fi power off and then you can scroll down to mode and then you can choose either client or host. Now host is when the Wi-Fi network is being generated by the camera and client is if you want the camera to connect to another Wi-Fi network. So we're gonna leave it on host and then turn the Wi-Fi power on. Should be a little tick there. The Wi-Fi host password is also important. The default for our cameras is ARRI ARRI, lowercase altogether, no space, ARRI ARRI. But you might wanna change that because if you're going on to set, you probably don't want someone else jumping on if they know what the default Wi-Fi wi password is. So you can set that to whatever you like. Now there's one other thing we have to do. We have to turn on the CAP server. So CAP is camera access protocol, and that's basically letting the camera know that we're gonna send camera control commands in via ethernet and Wi-Fi in this case, and that it should accept those commands and change settings. So make sure that the CAP server is on with a tick, and then you just wanna double check what that CAP server password is as well. By default, it will be ARRI all in lowercase. All right, so now that we've done that, we can jump back to the app and fill in those details. So I know that the wireless password is ARRI ARRI lowercase and the CAP password is ARRI. Now, as soon as you put those details in, the app will try and connect to the Wi-Fi network generated by the camera. You don't actually have to go into the Wi-Fi settings of the device that you're using. If it doesn't connect uh, automatically, then you can press the little refresh icon here and then the dialog box should pop up and say it wants to join the network that is created by the camera. And yes, that is correct. I want to join that. Give it a couple of seconds. It will run through and connect. So now you can see that I'm in standby and the iPad here is connected to the Wi-Fi generated by the camera. If you want to put in a description for your camera, you can totally do that. I'm going to put this in as Alexa 35. Whoops, like so because I'm gonna have an Alexa Mini LF attached later on. All right, so now we are done with the setup. If you press the save button and the app will open and launch into the default layout. Now, you will probably need to adjust to this layout depending on what kind of device you're using the app on because all the different devices have different screen resolutions and can fit more information on them. And so you will need to choose, but we're gonna go through and I'll show you how to do that in a second. So now I'm just gonna talk about some of the features of the app. There are a whole heap of gray boxes here and you can change the color of those boxes and they are called tiles and they are all basically buttons and some of them also show you information so they can be little status boxes as well. So for example, I can see all my exposure settings really clearly here. And I've created this layout and it's designed to mimic the placement of the camera control parameters that are in fact on the camera as well. So you'll have frame rate in the top, and if I click on that, then you'll be given a couple of different ways where you can change the frame rate. So the frame rates are listed down below in a bunch of defaults, and they're the same defaults that are already inside the camera. I can then modify that, so I can either use uh, this little wheel here to adjust the frame rate in really small increments, or I could put in a custom frame rate so maybe 33, 33 frames per second. Enter that, and then that pops up in the list. Now, if I tick the modify camera list and then the plus button, 
Well, now I've just saved that new frame rate as another default inside the camera. To go back to the home screen, I can either swipe down or press the little X in the top right corner, and now we're at 33 frames per second. When I'm in one of this type of button, where you're given a bunch of defaults and a wheel, all of those changes are happening live. So for example, if I go into white balance, every time I move this and I change the Kelvin value, it is happening live in real time, all right? And I can select a preset and get out of here. In the middle, you'll see a bright red and green record button. Now that is a special type of button that has basically one of those little missile flip up covers on it because if I press it, nothing will happen. But if I do a long press, it will remove that little cover and then I can press it and we've started recording. Now you can probably see as soon as I press this, it will stop. It's really responsive, the app. There's not really any delay, which is super lovely. There are two other types of buttons. There are buttons that are just switches, so they would be user buttons. So for example, I can turn false color on like this, and then it will turn yellow to signify that that feature is on. I'm gonna turn it off again. And there are also some buttons which offer you some more detail. So maybe a list view or a more comprehensive way to change a setting. So let's talk about those. The list view buttons, uh, an example would be looks because you can have loads of looks. Um, or maybe textures, which is a fun thing to talk about on this camera. So when I hit the texture, a little metadata display button there, then I can change my texture. I'm gonna leave that on nostalgic though, because I think the nostalgic texture is pretty cool. So there are some very unique buttons and functionality you can find with the app as well. One of them is the button group button. So that is a little uh, folder that we've made, which groups together a bunch of common user buttons. These are predefined and they relate to each SDI output. So you can have a button group for SDI one, a separate button group for SDI two, and then one also for the MVF here. What that is, if I click the button group for SDI, I then get a list of all of the user buttons dedicated to that monitoring output in one convenient place. That's just a bit easier than having to set up all of the individual custom user buttons. But again, you might like to do that. So obviously I have some duplicated ones here because I know I'm always gonna be turning on and off false color. So I've also set that as a separate switchable user button in this layout here. Another unique button is the playback button. So if I go into playback, I get this little indicator here. I can play the clip. I can also scrub through it with my little dial here. And I can also scrub through it on the little timeline thing down below, which is quite nice. If there's metadata in the clip, then I select the I button and I get the metadata. And also on the top left here, there's that little button which will bring up the clip list, which is great because I can see the full clip names and the duration of each take and everything like that. And I can select a new clip and then play it. Exiting that one. Now there is a web UI button, which is what this little symbol is here. And if I press that, well, that will bring up the traditional web interface that you would know if you've connected to one of our cameras before. And then I get full menu control and just like you would with the viewfinder. Now, one kind of nice thing about that is that if I uh, go down to the metadata section and I want to set my name as the cinematographer, well, I can enter that with a keyboard instead of having to use the dial on the viewfinder, which is quite a bit more ergonomic. So that's me, how good. Another cool little feature or specific user button here is the frame grab user button. And if I press that, it's actually gonna send a frame grab from the camera over Wi-Fi. Now, depending on what different, uh, type of camera you have, the picture resolution and the monitoring settings will affect how um, or what kind of file it is. So usually on our cameras, the SDI one settings, whether it has false color on or frame lines or status info, they will be printed in the frame grab that's sent. And then you can post it straight to Instagram. Below that, we have a very special user button, which is just for sensor flip, which I know a lot of ACs have been crying out for. And currently, particularly on say the Mini LF, sensor flip is not something you can set as a user button. So now there is a dedicated sensor flip user button, which you can do and change here, which is fantastic. All right. Another little cool thing you can do is change some more complicated settings in a way that I think is actually a little easier than doing it on the camera. So for example, if I wanted to change the recording resolution or the codec that I'm recording in, instead of having to do that in multiple steps, 
on the camera with the viewfinder, I can now click my little recording resolution status tile here. And then I get this full list. So I can select, okay, I'm gonna to go to ProRes 422 HQ for this shot. And I'm gonna go into the 4K 16 by nine sensor mode and record that in HD. All right, and then I hit set resolution and then it will load the camera into that kind of sensor mode with those recording settings that I'm after, which is quite nice because on the camera, you would have to first set your codec and then go out and set your resolution, et cetera, whereas this gives you all the options it is possible to choose and removes the ones that aren't possible, which I think is pretty cool. Another little unique function is if I go into the power menu on the app, I then get an interface where I can quickly change both the input priority for this camera, so that would be either the power input on the side or the battery on the back, the beam out battery, and I can flick that through at the top here, and I can set my warning levels for each of those inputs in either percentage or voltage. And then the last type of button to talk about is user buttons, and that's gonna nicely segue us into making our own layout. So on the app, there are two different kinds of user buttons that you can set up. You could either set up a camera user button on the screen here. So actually my false color user button here, that's a camera user button because it is replicating the functionality of user button one on the camera. And when I turn it on and off, I get my little user button changing here because they're the same thing. So if I change the user button on the camera, so if I change camera user button one to check log C, then it would come up here and say check log C instead. And I can change the functionality from here as well. So it will change the functionality of the button on the camera. Now, the second type of user button is called a local user button. And that's a user button that is specific to the app. So I can have an infinite number of, of local user buttons, all set to different functionalities, which are set through the app. So that is where it becomes a really powerful way to have a customized interface that really suits your workflow. So my little local user button on the left will turn yellow to signify it being on and off, and it's set to frame lines. And I wanna change that, or actually, I wanna add another local user button. So if I hit the little edit button in the top right, the first thing you'll notice is that a little indicator of the scroll limit appears. Now that is an indication of the resolution of the display you are using. I can move this over, place tiles outside of the scroll limit, but then I would have to scroll over on screen to change them. Whereas if I keep everything inside the scroll limit, if I go out of this by pressing the exit button where the edit button was, now I can't scroll the interface, which is kind of nice. So hit the edit button. To put a new tile in, which would have a button function, I have to basically change the size of the container at the moment or remove another button because there's nowhere else for me to put it. Now, what I mean by the container, we would call this like the tile box. And if you click on your little layout here, you can then adjust the size of the box which you then put tiles into. And you can have multiple tile boxes on your display, which we'll do when we have different uh, cameras or two cameras on the one page. That's how you define them. So I've just made it a little bit bigger here. You'll notice there are basically preset um, sizes for how big it can be and a default tile for most of these things is three units high. So I've gone down three notches. Now I need to add something. So at the top, just below the exit button, there's this little three yellow squares, which kind of look like three slices of cheese maybe. And if I hit that, I then get a list of all the different types of buttons that I can drag into my little tile box. So I'm gonna put another local user button and I'm gonna drag this over here and maybe I'll do another one for good measure. So I then hit the three yellow squares again and now I can click on that user button the yellow square goes on the tile itself. Down the bottom, you can see the different shades of gray that I can choose, or I could press no gray so it's transparent and shows the um, color that is being set for this tile box by the camera that the tile box is controlling. So in this case, the A camera with red that we set in the project settings. By the way, if you would like it to be Ari Blue, this is the color code you need to set for Ari Blue. Um, but I'm gonna leave that on gray. Now there's also this little dotted box here. Maybe I'll show you with this one. That would remove the, I have to do it on two. That would remove the border 
between two buttons, which you might like to have for your status information at the top, for example. So back down here, I can also hit the little arrows to resize how big I want this button to be. And if I hit the little menu icon, then I can click either delete to remove it or button function. And then I can go through here and I can set one of many different functions for that particular user button tile. So I might put that as SDI color bars and I'll go over here and I'll change the function to return in. So that's how you add buttons. Then you would hit the exit button where the edit button was. And now you can do it. And of course, when you hit them, they will turn yellow to signify that the user button is active. And now there is SDI color bars happening. All right, well, with that information, I hope you can go and make your own custom layout. And please remember to send us an email if you think you've made a cool one. We'd love to see what they look like. One other nice little button that I can add is a camera switcher button. So if you scroll through the add button menu, you will see a little button that has two cameras in it. And if I grab that and move that over here, then it will give me a list of cameras that are in this project. So at the moment, there's only one, but now I'm gonna go and I'm gonna put this camera onto the Wi-Fi network I've set up in this room, along with another camera that I have. And then that's a really quick way to change between different cameras on set. So let's do that now. All right, so I've connected this camera and the iPad now to a Wi-Fi network that was already in this room by changing the settings on the camera to be in client mode instead of in host mode and then connecting to the Wi-Fi network with the settings that are inside the camera. One other cool thing actually is that there is a mode here where instead of having to enter the Wi-Fi details, you can make a QR code of the Wi-Fi information and then put a lens on your camera and have the camera film the QR code and it will automatically get the information, the, SSS, the SSID and the password from that QR code so you don't have to click through with the um, little wheel here, which is pretty cool, I think. So I've done all that and I need to add a second camera. So I've actually put a second camera onto the same Wi-Fi network and there really isn't a limit to how many cameras you could have on the same Wi-Fi network. So I then go to project settings and you can see here that I've added a second camera, which is recording because it's actually this camera here. Um, and I do that by pressing the little plus button at the top. So I could add another camera here and you'll see it will default to be green with camera C, um, but I'm just going to remove that one there as I only have two cameras. Now you can do it kind of a couple of different ways. I haven't chosen to use Bonjour. If you use that, it just means you can connect the, um, to the cameras by just putting the serial number and the um, just the serial number in, which is very easy. Um, but I've chosen to specifically not use that and put in a Wi-Fi address because I've set up the cameras with static IP addresses, which is probably how I'd recommend you do it on big sets that are going to stay the same for a long period of time as it can be a little more reliable long-term. Um, so if I hit save, I then get back to the screen we were just looking at before. Now, I need to add another layout here so that I can control my second camera. So if I go edit, I just wanna show you first off that because there are now two cameras in the project, if I go into the settings for this layout or this tile box, um, I then now have a new option which says camera A and I could select that to be camera B and then it will connect and now I get the settings for the mini LF that is filming my little cutaway here. As well, if I make this a bit bigger, and I go in and I put in that camera switcher, which is just here. All right. So now you will see that there are two cameras and I can use that as a button to switch between the two cameras, which could be quite nice if you just had the one interface or particularly if you have an iPhone, which is obviously a bit smaller, you can then use that to switch between two cameras. So let me go in here, I'll just remove that and I'll show you another way of doing it. So if you click on your tile box and then you go to the menu, you can set insert new and that will make another box. And this might be where you could have different functions, kind of up to you. 
I can drag that around. So I'm going to put it down here. And then I'm actually going to press the little icon here and go load layout. Now this is where all of the default layouts live and also all of the layouts that you've created yourself. So I'm going to put the same one as I had before. So that's that little um, one here and I can drag that over so it's with in the bounds of my scroll limit. I'm gonna put a little one uh, line space in here as well so that it's got a bit of differentiation. And now I can go in here and change camera A to be camera B. I exit. So that's a really nice way that you can have multiple cameras on screen at the same time. One other thing you might like to do is explore our pages functionality. So what we can do is, as well as having multiple layouts on screen connected to different cameras or with different groups of buttons, you can also have different pages across the top. So it just like tabs in a web browser. So if we go to the edit mode, I then have this little plus icon up here. And if I touch that, it will open a new thing here called session one. So I can hit the three dots and rename that. And maybe I call this one a35, because that is my A camera on this shoot, and then return. And then I'm gonna make another one, and I'm gonna call that one mini LF. So we have a second tab here. And then I can have different um, layouts within each of the tab. So if I click on this one, for starters, I wanna change it to be camera B. And then I'm gonna go into the load layout section. And this is where obviously all my default layouts uh, and uh, ones that I previously made are stored. So I might choose one of the iPhone layouts that will fit the screen quite nicely. And then I'm gonna go back to the A35 one and do exactly the same thing, uh, which I'm do over here, sorry. Load layout, iPhone. All right, so then on this page, we have a status information for multiple cameras. Maybe it's our multicam scenario. You could have you know, six cameras on the front page just with critical information that you wanna see at a glance, make sure everyone's at the same frame rate. And then across the top, you can have different tabs which each give you more granular control. So that's how you can control multiple cameras. There's a very similar thing with the iPhone, which isn't applicable to the iPad, where you can actually have a different layout in uh, landscape as portrait. So that's set to uh, be on by default because the you know iPhone has quite a narrow aspect ratio. It wouldn't make sense to have one layout for both. So literally when you just rotate your phone, you can have two lots of completely separate buttons there and you set them up one in landscape and then one in portrait mode, um, which I think is quite cool. Now, one other little extension thing, which you can try on your own some other time, is that when you set up multiple cameras, you don't have to have them connected to the same Wi-Fi network. We think that's the best way to do it because it's probably more reliable and you can have a really strong Wi-Fi router on set. But if you don't have that, you can set up two cameras, which would each be in host mode, and then when you have the project settings set up to be auto connect to wireless network, when you change between cameras with the camera switcher button in the layouts, it will actually automatically change the Wi-Fi network that the iPad is connected to. So it will connect to the A camera when you have the A camera on screen and if you flick that to be the B camera, then it will connect to a B camera that you have somewhere else in the Wi-Fi network that the B camera is generating. Look, there are a lot of other little features in here as well, like you can set focus marks, for example. Um, lots of stuff. I'll let you explore all that. We're gonna have more Tech Talk videos coming out over the months as we develop more features and as we get your feedback. So please, again, send that into companionapp at ari.de. And thanks so much for watching the video. We're really excited to see what you do with this app. And um, yeah, we'll see you in the next one. Thanks.